as usual, the whole theme of this has been taking graphs that you're already familiar with and then transforming them in some way, applying some kind of function that does something that alters the behavior of that graph, right? And it doesn't make it something unrecognizable. There's clearly a relationship. But the kinds of relationships are, well, they're not immediately obvious, okay? Now, we've already focused on a whole different ways of transforming. What kinds of ways do we know how to transform graphs already? You can, um, you can take two graphs and you can add them together, right? Which, of course, implies subtraction. You can also take two graphs and rather than adding or subtracting, you can multiply, multiply right? Which therefore also implies division, okay? So that's when you've got two components and you put them together. You're combining them in some way. That's why I was calling them composite functions. Now, just to finish out, we're going to look at graphs raised to a power. I'm going to focus on three powers in particular, namely two, as you can see from this example, three, and a half, which is basically, well, it's a square root, yeah? Um, there are loads of other powers in between, obviously, that you can look at. But if you nail the behavior two, three, and a half, you have all the tools you need to look at any other power you like. So here's where we're going to start. I've got my sine x on there. You've probably got a decent one there already. As you've already um, noticed, all of our arguments here are visual. So the bigger you and more accurate you make your original graph, the better you'll be able to make some arguments about this guy. Okay? All right. Now, just like before, a crucial piece of understanding what's going on is to think about ordinates. Think about ordinates. So for instance, the range of sine x, the range. How low can I go? How high? One to one. Negative one to one. Yeah, so I'm just going to pop that on there. Negative one to one. Now the reason why that's important is because when I square negative one or one, I know exactly what's going to happen to those ordinates, right? The square of one, of course, is? One. One. And the square of negative one is? I. Also one. I. Not the square root. I. Not the square root. I. I. Just the square. Yes. Just the square. See, actually, can I just say, and, um, just wait until we get into um, into next year and there are some Aww. topics which are spoilers. But one of the hardest things that Extension 2 students in general encounter is that you're like, you know so much stuff. You're like, wait, which one is it? Like, I know I know too many things. So you need to organize that mind palace and get it, get it in order. Otherwise, you'll be in trouble. And you'll confuse yourself with whether it's a square or a square root. Okay, uh, what are negative one? Those are easy ordinates to look out for. What other easy ordinates are there? All the roots, right? Everywhere I get an x-intercept, the ordinate is zero. So the square of zero is zero. Okay. So I'm getting this kind of behavior. Okay. Now, have a look at this. Um, you notice all of my x's, I mean, they don't do the whole thing. But they're enough to see that, applying the logic to what you already know to squares, right? Everything in my new graph that I'm going to draw soon Everything's going to be above the axis, or it will just touch, right? Why is that? Because it's squared. Yeah, the, the smallest a square number can be, at least where we're in, um, we're in the real world, right? X and Y. The smallest that a square number can be is zero. You can't get a negative number out of that, okay? So whenever you have a graph and it's being squared, therefore you know, okay, I'm up here in this region, right? That's the first thing I notice. Then the second thing I notice is a little bit harder, okay? What's going to happen between here and here. How is it going to get there? For instance, um, you know, we had a look at asymptotes. We say, oh, okay, I've got a graph, it's doing that. And then I've like adjusted it in some way, like multiplied or divided it by something. Sometimes you'll be above that. And then sometimes you'll be below, even if you're still approaching the same asymptote. So here, when I look at sine x, I pose the question to you. When I square it, am I going to be just above the sine curve or just below? And importantly, how do you know? Oh, what do you reckon? Oh, Raph, sorry, or sorry. Jay, do you want to suggest? Um, like, the graph itself, it's up to one. Therefore, all the, all the points, all the points here, it's, um, it's a fraction, which is lower than one. The fraction squared, it will be a smaller fraction, which is longer. Very, very good. Okay, in case you didn't catch that, right? I'm going to rub this off in a second because it's going to make my diagram too busy. But think about, again, think about the ordinates. Are you sick of me saying this yet? It's, it's the crucial tool, right? Think about all these ordinates in here. Now, I'm just going to put some vertical lines, like so. Now, the lengths of, excuse me, <coughs> thank you. The lengths of all of these lines, right, they're all between not and one. Do you agree with that? So they're these fractions, okay, or, or they're proper fractions, right? Now, if you square a number that's like, say, you know, that'll be a half maybe, right? Well, when you square a half, is it going to get taller or shorter? And the answer is it's going to get shorter. It's going to be half of a half, which is a quarter. 
you know, even a number like this, maybe nine tenths might be that length. When you square that, and that's what I'm doing to all of the ordinates, again, it's going to get smaller. Nine tenths would become 81 hundredths, right? Which is close to A on 10, so that's again lower, right? So therefore, everywhere in here, I'm lower. Do you agree with that? Okay, now, therefore, I know I'm going to be in this region, but then the final question is well, in that region, how am I behaving? What am I actually going to do, right? Let me ask you this, okay? You've noticed um, there's a concavity to this, right? It's concave down. Do you agree with that? How can I get to, from here to here, keeping in mind this concavity, right? How am I going to get from here to here without crossing over? Because you've told me, right, all of these, they're proper fractions, so when I square them, I've got to stay underneath, right? So I can't possibly go above, right? So how am I going to get there? How am I going to do it? Okay. Now, you've got some choices. Like, I mean, I could kind of try to do like a straight line, like that. Or I could try and do it just underneath. But before I draw that, I want you to notice, I have a stationary point here, right? You remember when we were multiplying functions before? We were doing multiplication and division, okay? And in a sense, what I've got is I'm multiplying a function by itself. Sine x and sine x. And they both have a stationary point there, right? They're both leveling off. And if I zoom in really, really far, I get that horizontal line. Because that's what that stationary point looks like at high magnification, okay? So if I've got a stationary point, and I'm multiplying it by another stationary point, what do you expect the product of those to be? It's also going to be a stationary point. Okay. Now, if I'm stationary there, but I've got to come underneath, right? then clearly I've got to drop down like this. Do you see that? Like I've got to stay underneath. I've got to stay underneath sine x, right? So I'm horizontal here, stationary point, and then I drop down. Okay. But I can't keep doing this, right? I can't stay on my present course and still get to here. Do you see that? Like, I had to be more concave down. I had to um, be decreasing faster going this direction. But if I keep on going this course, I'm just gonna, I'm never gonna get to there, right? So I've gotta increase here, but I've gotta slow back down to get to here, right? Like this. There has to be a change in concavity. Do you see that? Do you, do you see how I argued that? If I don't, I'm not going to make it to that point. Okay. So there's actually a point of inflection here. Like I've said before, once we learn the calculus of trigonometric functions, we'll be able to differentiate and then differentiate again, and we will find, bam, right in there, point of inflection. Okay. But I'm making a visual argument. It's not as strong. It's good enough for me. Okay. Now that was the hard part. That was all the work. Now that I've got this piece in here, and I'm just going to fix it up because it's not the it's not the most accurate. I can do it better if I do it in one line rather than two. There we go. Now that I've got that shape in there, everything else in the side curve and the side, x, side squared x curve is going to follow that thing, right? Because you see from here to here, I've got a shape. But from, and let's, let's do some numbers here, right? From 90 degrees to 180 degrees, I'm doing the same thing in reverse. Do you see that? So therefore, when I square, I'm going to get the same thing in reverse. Okay, now lastly, down here, this is the same shape as this, but just underneath. What difference does that make when I square it? Absolutely none. No difference, because the sign, which is the only difference here, it gets lost. That information is lost when I square it. Okay? So therefore, the shape I'm going to get over here is an exact copy of this guy. Okay, so I'm going to get this. Ta-da! And there, it's a bit lopsided, but you get the idea. There is my sine squared x curve. Interestingly, it's periodic every 180 degrees rather than every 360. Okay? But that's it. That's simple. Okay. Any questions on that? Right, so what I want you to note is um, a couple of things. Number one, just what we're talking about, even sign. This is like our summary and conclusion. Okay? If I raise to the power of 2 or 4 or 6 or 8, you're always going to get an even number of those, right? So even if there's a negative, you'll have like two negative signs multiplying, or four, or six, or eight negative signs, and they'll all cancel, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore, I conclude even powers, right, they eliminate out sine. Sine, and <laughs> I should say a bad example, sine with a G, right? Positive, negative, that information gets lost as soon as you square. 
Okay. They eliminate sine. And in addition to this, right, how would you describe this behavior in here? It's increasing, but do you notice it's increasing faster at a certain point than this ever gets to. Okay. So there's kind of like a more extreme behavior. And we're going to note this when we have a look at sine cubed x. Okay. 